So seriously, though, mess this up. This meeting is now called to order. Roll call, please. Mrs. Cloninger? Here. Mrs. Cons? Here. Mr. Le Pioneer Elementary, uh, and I did not know this. It's a very much a family affair at Pioneer Elementary School. They have five staff members who have students attending the school, 10 staff members who have had students here in the past, and one staff member who's excited to have her son start here next year. They also have two husband and wife teams, one mother-daughter team down from two last year and many years prior, and a pair of sisters. Without further ado, Brian Casebury, you have the floor, sir the principal of Pioneer Elementary. This is the board, Superintendent Haber, thanks so much for highlighting Pioneer Elementary School. In the last couple of years, we've done a lot to increase student sense of belonging and student voice. One of the main ways we've done that is with the help of Mrs. McCray next to me, who is our awesome digital learning coach. We have student performances, student um, recordings that we do, which you're going to get the opportunity to see. Ms. McCray will introduce the students who've come. Good evening. The Wolfie News, which we're going to share with you guys tonight, is one of our community tools that actually highlights different staff voices and every week. I'm so excited, this is the best part, um, to introduce we agree. Scarlett Turner to you tonight. They are shining examples of our broadcasting talent on our fourth and fifth grade team, and you will see um, some of the great work that they do for me. Um, so we hope you enjoy this broadcast we've created for you guys. It will highlight some of the extracurricular activities that are available to our pioneer students. Enjoy. Good evening, Pioneer Wolves. Today is Thursday, November 2nd. Welcome to Wolfie News. November 2nd is National Stress Awareness Day. Do you know a great way to keep your stress low? You can join an extracurricular club here at school doing something that you love and finding friends who love doing the same things you do. That will keep your stress low. Yes, our field reporters, Scarlett and Forrest, have visited some of our different clubs recently. Scarlett and Forrest, we cut to you. Thanks, Leah. You are absolutely right. We've gone to many incredible Pioneer clubs recently. Scarlett, I heard you were in the cross country club. Yes, I just completed an awesome season. Take a look. Runners completed an average of 27 miles, which is over the distance of a marathon. Pioneer had nine top finishers in their age group. Bravo, team! Now we cut to Melanie for the joke of the week. What is harder to catch the faster you run? I don't know what. Your breath. <laughs> we are hanging out at Robotics Club. So Robotics Club engineers have been learning JavaScript coding to program EVC robots to complete different missions. This robot is programmed to run across the map, up the bridge, triggers the two flags, and return back to home base. Impressive work by this engineering team. Now we pause for Bob's tidbits. Skylight and Forrest are with Bob, Pioneer Service Talk. Bob, we know you are busy working every day. 
However, if you were to go to a Pioneer Club, which one would you choose? My favorite club is Dance Club. Let me show you. Break for a commercial. Are you interested in taking the perfect picture? I actually signed up for photography class. Do you enjoy leaving your mark on the world with a paintbrush? I love painting. Maybe you love chess and enjoy the challenge of beating a worthy opponent. All of these skills are coming to a future Pioneer Club near you. Stay, Stay tuned, tuned for all the details. details. Mission Possible is a group of fifth grade building leaders who work together to make Pioneer a kinder place. We want all students and staff members to feel like they belong. We do this by completing missions. Some of our current missions include volunteering for teachers, mentoring younger students in reading and writing, and a school newspaper. Future missions we are excited about supporting include the Ronald McDonald House, a school-wide fun drive, and helping with projects to make Pioneer look more beautiful. Wolves, that's all for today. Please tune in next week for another edition of Wolfie News. In the meantime, please figure out what club you want to join. Yes, we have lots of new clubs we want to join. And we are excited that we will make new friends as well. I want to join Bob's Dance Club. <laughs> have, have a wolf-tastic day, everyone! Now we're back. There we go. Great. Uh, thank you, Pioneer, Mr. Casebeer. Next up, uh, Mr. Temby gets the privilege of introducing Liberty High School. Well, well, this is a school near and dear to my heart. I've got two Lancer grads in the, the family here. Liberty High School is the only school in the district with CNA and EMT courses. Last year, they had 31 students in the CNA program with a 100% passing grade. They also had 30 students in the EMT program with a 90% passing rate. Liberty has a school snake. Her name is Harriet, and she, and she was probably 17 years old. You can see a picture right there. That's enormous. <laughs> She's been at Liberty for 15 years now. She's a boa constrictor, red-tailed boa. She's about 10 and a half feet and weighs about 65 pounds. She's sweet and likes to give hugs. No thanks. Um, and we have a <laughs> we have a picture of Harriet, which is up. I especially love the expression on the face of the student holding the tail. That would be my expression. So, so please welcome Principal Matt Sisson. Hi, my name is Juliet, and I'm a senior at Liberty and student body vice president. I'm here today with Seth, who is a senior student council representative. We are here today to talk about Battle of the Schools, also known as BOTS. When I was a freshman in high school, we would talk about an informal contest of who could raise the most money for Harvest of Love. For those who don't know, that is a fundraiser that we do during the month of November to raise money for Care and Share. At each assembly, we would say something along the lines of, are we going to beat Pine Creek or maybe Rampart this year? But I always had this thought in the back of my mind, what if there was an actual competition? Over the summer, I met up with Air Academy, Pine Creek, Rampart, and DCC. Together, we created what is now known as Battle of the Schools. It is a competition between the schools based on attendance, spirit, and money raised at various fundraisers throughout the year. The winner of each round will get the Spirit Cup, which we have here with us today. When the winning school has it, they can decorate it how they want and display it how they want. 
To talk about the events that we have, I will pass it on to Seth. The first round of events were fall sports. We counted three, football, soccer, and volleyball games. Additionally, we counted the senior night for boys tennis, softball, golf, and cross country. Now you are probably wondering what we mean by counting. Here's how it works. One student equals one point, but we quickly ran into a problem relating to student population differences. Therefore, we changed it to count the percent of attendance at games. Currently, we don't have the final numbers, but the winning school will be announced in the next few days. Our second round of events is Harvest of Love and Performing Arts. For Harvest of Love, one dollar or one can equals one point. For Performing Arts, we are counting all four nights of the fall plays, along with one night of a band concert and one night of a choir concert. At the end of the semester, the BOTS committee plans to meet for discussions for second semester. Now I will pass it back to Julia to talk about longevity. Thank you, Seth. Throughout this process, we have been amazed by the support from schools and the students and staff at the schools. But then came the problem of longevity. How are you going to keep this going year after year? One of the ways we are working on this is with the Spirit Cup. You may notice that there is a lot of blank on the Spirit Cup. That is on purpose. At the end of the year, the winning school will get their name engraved on it as well as the year that they won it. This year, it can be passed, or this will allow it to be passed on from school to school, year to year. Before I pass it off to Mr. Sisson, I would like to say thank you to the students who have come to the games, the bookkeepers for helping with ticket numbers, and finally, the student councils who have put their time and effort into creating Battle of the Schools. Thank you. Now I would like to pass it to Mr. Sisson to talk about one of the ways we're raising money for Harvest of Love. Yes, Seth. Um, another one of our student groups that has exploded at, sorry, another tall guy, um, is our dance program at Liberty, which is the only dance program in the Colorado Springs area and specifically in District 20. We now have over 200 students participating in our dance program and ha had to expand uh, with an extra teacher to support the number of students wanting to participate. One of the interesting things is our senior class in the dance program put together a dance clinic for K through six students to come and participate. And through the registration, all of their proceeds completely support the care and share process for Harvest Love. And it's it's very exciting to see an expansion of a program so much and so that our students went and performed at the National Dance Conference in Denver this year where Leslie Williams was also recognized as the dance teacher of the year uh, at the national level. So we're very excited for this group of seniors to be such movers and shakers after such a rocky start to their freshman year. They're definitely leaving after four years, um, making a difference in their, in their greater community. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Matt Sisson, and uh, thank you uh, for uh, sharing with us Liberty High School. That's awesome. We now have a very special announcement. Mr. Casebeer, you would please come forward. Yep, and not not just you. I'm not surprised that you want to bring somebody else up there. That's typical of you. You always like to share the spotlight when things go well there, so it's awesome. Without further ado, I'd like to pass this off to uh, Superintendent Haber. Well, I was so excited to get a personal phone call from Governor Polis earlier this week, and he let me know that Pioneer Elementary School was named as one of the top 16 schools in the entire state to receive the Bright Spot Award. Uh, again, from Colorado Governor Jared Polis, Pioneer was recognized for their above average achievement in science, and the school will receive $50,000 uh, of Federal Governor's Emergency Education Relief Fund. And it's to purchase educational technology, offer summer school, after school programming, professional development, and any other opportunities uh, that you uh, would think would most benefit our students. So he did ask me a question, and that was, what's their secret? So. Uh, Principal Case Bear, would you like to share your secret, please? Sure. Pioneer has an absolutely awesome staff. We've really embraced the PLZ concept. We try to do that really well, which just 
involves being really clear about what kids should learn and uh, doing everything we can to make sure they learn at high level. Certainly that's true in science too. So hats off to our staff, particularly our fifth grade team, which just did an awesome job. Awesome. So we just have a little token of our appreciation. So, yeah, we and we would like you all to who who participated in the um, spotlight to come up front. Thank you, and we'll take uh, just about a, a three or four minute break. After we're going to, we're going to do IT, but then I'm also going to. Very good. Thank you. We need to have a motion to approve. Well, first of all, um, Ms. Matson Bonet, are there any updates to the agenda? There were updates to the agenda and the board was notified of these. Members of the board, are there any items you wish to move from the consent agenda? Are there any items to be added to the agenda? May we have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. 
Second. Roll call, please. Mrs. Cloninger. Aye. Mrs. Cons. Aye. Mr. Lavalley. Aye. Mr. Salt. Aye. Mr. Temby. Aye. Board quote is Ms. Cons. Thank you. So tonight's board quote is from Albert Einstein, and I'm glad there's still a few students here to, because it's for you guys among, for all of us as well. Learn from yesterday, live for today, hope for tomorrow. The important thing is to, is not to stop questioning. And so, you know, here in this realm of education, that is kind of our greatest wish for you guys is that you always feel the wonder and the excitement about learning and questioning um, everything about yourselves and about life around you and, and continue to seek more and more wisdom and, and uh, all the fruits of, of knowledge. Thank you. Board comments, we'll begin with Ms. Cloninger. Thank you. <clears throat> I went last week to Legacy Peak and um, th then was told, oh, come back tonight because we have a stargazer night, which was a lot of fun and not what I had planned for my evening, but uh, ended up in VR goggles right there in the bottom left with Mr. Dave Nelson, who was leading the kids on a very cool tour of um, our galaxy and different planets and things like that. It was really fun. And then <laughs> some of the kids were trying to hold the moon in their hands or the earth in their hands. That's what the little boy in the middle is doing. And then the planetarium, they had about four different little stations. And so the top left is us waiting to go into the planetarium, which is there on the right. It was a lot of fun. There have been a lot of trunk or treats. <laughs> and I went to a very cold one over at um, frontier that I had been invited to go because my son's, anyway, long story, but my son's guitar teacher had been one of the vendors that was coming to um, be there. And so these were just a few of the um, fun cars and some of the get-ups that people were in. And um, it was extremely cold and extremely windy, but this Star Wars one I had to put front and center because they really did it up and it was a lot of fun. The inside of their car looks actually like Star Wars. And from there I went straight over to a really scary show <laughs> called Trap over at Liberty. It was very entertaining and I had told my friend that I had t taken that I wanted to sit on the aisle because I like the aisle. I have longer legs and and then halfway through the play they started coming and whispering at some of the people in the aisle and they started falling out of their seats onto the ground and I thought I don't know why I chose this seat so I was glad that they didn't pick me <laughs> I have a feeling they were staged um, but it was a great play and we are definitely in the uh, the play mode right now because there's two or three others that we still have to go to yet um, and I look forward to all those performances and then another cold day <laughs> was this past Saturday, um, the, er, the um, state marching band semifinals and finals got squished into one because of the snow that was coming in, which thank goodness they did because at the time that it all ended, it was about a half an hour before finals should have started <laughs> and it would have been miserable. So the snow was coming in horizontal at us and and things like that. We had three of our schools compete, and um, so Pine Creek was uh, took fifth in 5A, and uh, in 4A, Rampart took fifth, and Air Academy took sixth. It was great, and to see the support, even in the freezing cold, was amazing. And then last, I don't even know what day we're on, two days ago was Halloween, and um, <clears throat> I made an appearance as school board Barbie. And if you notice in some of the pictures, there are some fun pictures here. Um, you know, weird Barbie doing the splits up in the left-hand corner. Um, it was DCC, um, the village, and also the trunk or treat at Pine Creek High School. Um, I really appreciate that all of you that were here for the spotlight came and um, presented. You guys do such a nice job and it gives us a whole lot of hope for 
for why we do this, which is because of all of you. So I'm grateful to your teachers and to um, you guys for having those great ideas of being inclusive and, and working together with the other schools. That's awesome. And um, incredible. I mean, I think Brian K. Spear just keeps outdoing himself with uh, now this award and, you know, good chunk of change for his school, which is, is um, apropos because he's done such a nice job. So um, I will just say have a great rest of your November and um, vote. Mr. Temby. Well, ditto on the uh, comments about our spotlights and the award for uh, Pioneer. Uh, again, I always say and many of us say great things happen in D20 every day, and that's evidence of it. And $50,000 is nothing to sneeze at. That's, that's quite an award for the school. I don't want to steal our superintendent's uh, thunder, but I did want to uh, give kudos to uh, uh, Superintendent Haber, uh, Dr. Smith, and everybody who's been involved with the uh, engagements of all of our stakeholder groups uh, to talk about a portrait of a graduate. And we're getting tremendous feedback to include the community feedback that we got at United Way when we engage some business leaders. So I think once we aggregate this data, um, it's going to help us in this process. And uh, as I, we were talking today, uh, the superintendent and I, about this process, it really has to have a dose of reality, which is these kids are going to go out into a very competitive world. And are we, as a school district, preparing them for post-secondary success? And what does that mean? Not just kind of soft things, but real concrete things that are going to help them be competitive and thrive and have a subsistence level income as they move forward. And so, but tremendous feedback. So thanks to the uh, uh, stakeholder groups, but uh, thank you for the initiative, Superintendent Haber. Really appreciate that. And I think I've just got one more slide from that process. And here's Here's her in action yesterday uh, in front of the parent uh, sounding board, which is a very large parent sounding board. I'm not sure if other districts have a like type group in addition to a district accountability committee, and ours is robust, our district accountability committee, but the set parent sounding board is a uh, fully populated and engaged group, and they gave some great feedbacks and, the, and their feedback, and they're great people to go back to their communities and talk about what's what's happening in D20 and what's great about D20. So so thank you, Superintendent, for this initiative. Uh, I think it's important that we really have our uh, eyes on the prize as a board, what our board ends mean, and what is the manifestation of that at the back end of an education. So thank you very much. And that's all, Ms. Lavelle. Ms. Kunz. So I had the privilege of getting to go visit a couple different of our programs uh, in our district over the last couple weeks. And I think I speak for all of us when I say that is uh, the ultimate joy in this position is getting to be with the students. And it's, um, there's just nothing like getting to see their wonderful personalities and their excitement for learning and um, just the great things they do. So I went over with uh, Chinook Trail Middle School to the Challenger Learning Center. And um, even our 16 year old daughter came with me because she missed uh, getting to go there a few years ago. So she was thrilled to get to go too. And um, so this is just some images. If you haven't been in there, I asked one of the teachers, one of the staff members at the center, if this is what a real spaceship looked like. And she's like, well, it's a little Star Trek-ish, but I think it looked very cool. So who knows the difference, right? Um, so it was really awesome to see the kids in one room, they have mission control and another room, the kids are on the ship, like you saw on the last slide. And I mean, they are getting simulations popping up on their screens and having to uh, call over, you know, the, the voice, the microphone PA system and, uh, move move their ship before then asteroid hits and all this great stuff so it was super fun to be there with them uh i got to two days ago um it is hard to remember heather <laughs> what day is what halloween bash uh over at the village high school um and just another special thing about this school is because it's uh a little 
um, unique with their schedule that they were able to modify the schedule just that day and have all kinds of crafts. The kids were making each other and staff members Halloween grams and they had a staff costume contest. Mrs. Clonger almost won. I'm sure it was a close second, but um, <laughs> and um, student costume contest. So here are some of our friends, Reagan and Aspen and all the Despicable Me crew here. So it was really awesome to be there. I did not get pictures and I'm not sure if Superintendent Haber is going to mention it at all, but uh, she and I went over to Pine Creek High School uh, several days ago for the, okay, she has a picture, um, for the ELL, the English Language Learners Dinner and Game Night with our high school families at Pine Creek. And it was probably the most impactful event I've ever been at as a board member. I just could not stop raving about it to my family. It was just really special to meet families who have come from other countries and are just seeking that American dream. They're just, I'm so proud of them. I'm so proud of their students for what they're doing. I'm so proud of the high school communities for welcoming them. And, you know, they all brought friends that they had met here, you know, um, local students who just have taken them under their wing and helping them learn the language and the culture. So it was just a real, real treat and a special thing to be with those families. So I was really pleased to be there. And then um, we, I got to, as Mr. Tembi mentioned, when we're working on the portrait of a graduate, I got to go, was it just yesterday? <laughs> so the superintendent student advisory committee and um, so some of the same students you saw in Mr. Tembe's pictures came back again, as well as some other ones. And uh, it's amazing to hear their intelligence and wisdom of what they want for skills and what they know they need. And my biggest takeaway that I wanted to share with all of you, mostly adults in the room, is that they are craving for a safe place to exert their independence and to learn more. So. It was really special to me. I told them thank you as a mother. I appreciate hearing that because um, I need to do more of that with my own children. But there's practical things we can do for our kids before they graduate 12th grade, like making sure they know how to call and make their own doctor's appointments. They were terrified when I mentioned that to them. <laughs> but when they're out of the house, I mean, those are the kind of skills that they want to develop among many other things. So that's just that was my takeaway for all of us adults and parents. And I believe uh, that is it. Thank you. Mr. Salt. Thank you. <clears throat> um, I don't have any pictures. So uh, speaking of Mr. Timby, or Mr. Timby taught, spoke about the portrait of a graduate with the linkage that we did last week. Uh, I ran into Mr. Olson at the Air Academy Rampart football game. Well, Rampart's football game that Air Academy was there too uh, last week. And uh, we were talking about the portrait of the graduate and he had a lot of really positive feedback from his students that came. He asked them what they thought. He said they had a great time and really appreciated the opportunity to, to speak up. So I'm sure that goes for other students, but I know specifically with his kids, he was really excited about that. Um, he asked me how I thought it went. I thought it went really well as well. Um, one of the interesting things that I've spoken about to some other folks was that a couple of the groups that I was at when we were talking about skills they wanted coming out of high school, many of them were soft skills, not hard skills. I even asked, are there any hard skills you know, think of that might be helpful? And they're like, no and kept going with the soft skills. So even when they wrote more things down, it was all still on the soft skills side. So I thought that was sort of an interesting, interesting thing uh, hearing them talk about that. I also went to the uh, state marching band competition, took uh, three of my four kids up there and uh, had a blast. They were, my, uh, my oldest, he's nine, he goes, that was a lot more fun than I thought it would be. I'm like, yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. There were some really, really good bands. We had to leave he had a soccer game, so we had to leave right after the 4A competition. Uh, so we skittled out of there before it got crazy cold. Um, we also went to Trap. It was a uh, right 
an interesting performance and concept. Uh, Mr. Lavalley and I uh, were able to go together and it was a lot of fun to to watch that. The produ producer, director uh, did a great job setting things up even before we walked in the door. Uh, I thought he did a great job. So um, it's been a lot of fun getting into some classrooms last week. Uh, one of the things, so I was at uh, Edith Wolford, got into classrooms, and had a lot of fun watching the instruction going on. And we were in a third grade classroom and they were going through a math lesson. And so it was something fairly simple, like 70 times three or 30 times seven, something like that. And so we asked the class, what's the answer? They all had the right answer. He goes, great. And so asked them how they had figured it out. And there were three or four different ways that the students had kind of factored and done the problem. And so he gets on his board and starts writing things down. And I don't know that he's doing that right, but I'm not a math teacher. So I was like, I'm just not going to say anything. Then he gets to the end, he goes, whoops, I made a mistake. And so he stopped and he said, all right, what do we do when we make a mistake? This class says we own it, we understand it, we fix it, and we learn from it. And so he stepped him right through that and he went through the entire process and moved through, got the right answer and moved on. I'm sure he was a little uh, frustrated getting a simple question wrong in front of you know the principal and the board member, but he did a great job. I was really impressed with how he ran the class and how he worked through those problems. And it's like everybody makes mistakes and that's okay. The important thing is that you learn from it and move on. So I thought it was a really good lesson for us uh, to consider. That's all I have, Mr. LaValle. Uh, I also attended, yeah, the play trap. It was so interesting. I, my wife and I were like, who, who thought of a play like that? It was, it was fascinating. But what's that? No. Well, I, no, I was not. My wife was, and I was, I don't see, I hate being called on for those things. Like, I just want to sit in the corner and watch. And, and fortunately, I did not, we did not get called on. So that was good. But I wanted to thank, um, uh, Steve Skelsey, who was the director, I thought they did a great job and, and it was also appropriate for all ages, which I, I always kind of look for. And it was it was just a great performance and I really enjoyed it uh, there at Liberty High School. And I also, even though Liberty isn't my school, I have Air Academy, I was able to watch the Liberty High School marching band performance date. I went on Friday and I, oh yeah, there's the, this is the first slide. Yes, it was sun, sunny, but it was cold and yes, it was windy. And yes, they told me to park, they, they directed me to park on the extreme north end of the stadium. And yes, the only entrance was on the south end. Not that I was bitter about that, but I did let the folks know when I left, I said, you do realize that the only entrance is on the extreme other side. It took me 15 minutes to get there, but I still made it on time. And uh, the next slide, which I was so impressed with, um, oh, how about if I do it? Six xylophones. I couldn't believe it. Six of them. I, where do you get six xylophones? By the way, do they still call them xylophones? Are they still called xylophones? Okay, good. But anyways, I, I just thought they did a great job. It was really fun watching them and hats off to, to all the bands. Uh, I don't think it was as cold on Friday as it was on Saturday. So you all are, are even stronger than I was uh, going out there. Hey, can I just make one mention? Please. Because I'm seeing this gal running in the back here. In our Pine Creek group, we had one of the trombonists get knocked in the head with one of the flags from one of the gals and it broke his trombone, his trombone slide. So he couldn't even play, but he stayed up and he acted like he was doing it because he knew that it would be points off for his whole team. I just wanted to say that because it's sorry. It no, no, that's awesome. That's awesome. And I tell you what, I, I was in band through my junior in high school when it's cold, Trying to play an instrument is really, really hard. It's you, you tend to go flat, uh, and it's 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 very, very difficult. So my hats off to all, all the the band members. I always kind of joke. I used to tell my kids, you know, uh, the band members are the are the people will be your bosses uh, when, when you get older. So a band is a great it's a great thing. Um, oh, it was it was interesting too. They had a bunch of F thirty five flybys uh, that they had to compete with, and I, I confess I was like, oh, they didn't go right over the stadium, but they went they went pretty close by, which I thought was interesting. Um, and, and then I also attended yesterday the Parents Sounding Board, which uh, was great. They talked about the uh, portrait of a graduate as well. And I, I, I too share Mr. Temby's sentiments. Uh, I think it's a great thing to look at. What do we want to see? What, what, is, our, what is our output, uh, if you will? 
<clears throat> so I thought that that was great. And I got to thinking, I often compliment the DAC because we always approve the DAC. I always approve, I, I thank the um, Citizens Bond Oversight Committee, CBOC, because they come here. I never thank the Parent Sounding Board because we don't vote on on their attendance or their, their membership. So I just want to publicly thank the Parent Sounding Board. Uh, those parents, there was a lot of them there. They're, they're, they're interested, they're, they're dedicated, and I just appreciate um, all those parents that were there at the Parent Sounding Board. All right. Uh, I want to congrats to the TCA Boys and Girls Cross Country teams being state champions, um, which is awesome. They they do that a lot. But I want to spend a little bit of time talking about Air Academy, and I'm, I'm stealing uh, Superintendent Haber's thunder we talked about earlier. She said, yeah, go ahead. You know, I had two kids that ran cross country, and so I, I kind of know a little bit about Colorado State cross country. The girls, 5A, first of all, that's as high as you get. They're always very fast, very competitive. I believe they have, they run seven and score five. And the way it works in cross country, it's like golf. The lower the score, the better you get. And, and for your team, the first runner that comes across, that's Acme High School, Acme High School gets one point. And then the next runner that goes through, they, that one's two points. Um, they had, their five runners were all in the top 10. For 5A state, which is absolutely unbelievable. I, I, having been on a, my kids ran a TCA and they were state champ. My daughter was state champs all all three years of her cross country, all four years of track. I don't think they ever dominated like this. And that was 3A. This is 5A. So really phenomenal work by Air Academy girls cross country team, uh, not just state champs, but they blew them away. In fact, they had a total of only 26 points. The second place team at 120. And actually 120 is a very low score. That's a very competitive score when you run uh, seven and score five. So I, I just, it was, it was so amazingly fast. I think they're number two in the country. If, if, and it, it's hard to, to measure uh, how you are in the country. I, I, ass, I assume they're going to Nike nationals. I don't know that for a fact, but I, I hope they do because my, my daughter got to do that a couple of times. It's a great, it's a great thing. But anyways, my hat's off to the Air Academy High School um, girls cross country team who just, not just won, but they, they just blew away everybody. So, um, that's all I have. Without further ado, Superintendent Haber's comments. So I have uh, two celebrations that I want like to mention and then we'll take another break. And one is I know that we have uh, a new administrator. Uh, so would uh, Cameron Smart, Assistant Superintendent for Human Resources come up. And then we have another huge uh, school celebration uh, with uh, Timberview Middle School. <laughs> No. Yeah, there you go. I know it's been a while since I've got to speak to you guys, so I just thought, you know, maybe I'd get something for that. Um, also, congratulations to the Broncos, breaking the 16-game losing streak to the Kansas City Chiefs. Thank goodness Taylor, Taylor Swift was not in the house. I think that helped us a bunch. So but that, you're not here to talk about that. We're here to talk about um, one of our administrators that we're going to introduce to you tonight, who, um, as always, has went through the interview process with us and meets all the requirements. And... Um, and did uh, did very well, obviously, in the process. So I'm pleased tonight to introduce Chris Eggleston, who is being recommended as the Director for in Information Technology Application and Data Services. And do not ask me what that what they do, but apparently a lot of applications in data. Um, Chris is joined this evening by his wife, Siobhan, and the entire IT department, I think, over here, minus Shelly. I know there's a lot more, but these folks are here to also congratulate him as well. So we appreciate them being here. Um, so Chris holds a Bachelor's of Science in Computer Engineering from Colorado Technical University in Colorado Springs, and he began his educational career in District 11 as a computer repair and IT support. Then he went to Whitefield uh, School District as an IT technician and KBOX administrator, which I'm heard is very similar to an Xbox, I think, what I've heard. I don't know. Okay, that one didn't go over so well. All right. All right. Uh, database manager and assessment data analysis. Then he came to District 20 as a um, IC, uh, which is our information system for students, uh, support as a senior program analysis, and also some other information. He did start two businesses, I think, is that correct? Sold one, um, and then also, I think he built a computer when he was like five years old or something, and the Death Star when he was 12, but some kid from Tatooine broke it. So um, he's just amazing. I mean, this guy's amazing. So uh, we're super excited to have him step into this role to replace 
Kevin, which is kind of irreplaceable, but he's going to do an amazing job. So uh, currently he serves as our database application developer on the IT uh, ADS team, which is again for application and data services. So we're pleased to recommend Chris to you tonight for the position of Director for Information Technology for Application and Data Services. Chris, anything you'd like to say? Now, as Cameron said, my name is Chris Eggleston. I'm currently a database application developer on the IT ADS team, and I've been with the district for just over 10 years now. I am deeply humbled and honored to be recommended as the next director of IT ADS. I've been privileged to serve in various capacities within this team. I have witnessed firsthand the dedication, passion, and expertise that makes them not only an effective team, but also a paragon of excellence. The standard set by our current director is one of exceptional leadership and vision. My primary motivation in seeking this role is to ensure that we continue to build on this standard. I am committed to maintaining and further enhancing our team's reputation as one of the most highly regarded IT groups among school districts in Colorado. Having dedicated over a decade to this district, I am deeply invested in its success. Success. It's more than just a place to work. It's where I've grown professionally and I've come to understand the unique needs of our educational community. I want to express my sincere gratitude for your trust and consideration. If appointed, I will uphold the standards of excellence the district, the, this district is known for and lead the IT ADS team with integrity, dedication, and vision. Thank you. Thanks. See you next time. So now I would like to, uh, for Principal Karina uh, Behrman, come on up and your team. Uh, board, uh, I just really appreciate uh, Principal Behrman's uh, leadership at Timberview uh, and it was really outstanding. She supported CAMEL, which is uh, a statewide uh, organization that supports middle schools. And I had a chance to go to Camel, I think when it first started as a middle school uh, junior high teacher at that time as we were shifting to middle school uh, and also as a middle school principal. And I had a chance, I was out of town, unfortunately, I would have gone on that Saturday. Uh, but it's just a huge honor uh, for us to be able to host D20, to host the Camel Conference. A thank you to Learning Services. I know some of them came and helped to support um, the, some of the workshops there, but really thank you, uh, Principal Behrman, for hosting uh, the CAMEL uh, conference, and I invited uh, Principal Behrman to just share some of the highlights from the conference, as well as they had an amazing STEM night, and would like her to share about that too. Thank you. Thank you so much for having it, us. Uh, my name is Karina Behrman. I'm the principal of Timberview. Um, and really hats off to the ladies that are standing behind me. Without them, none of this would have been possible. So I'm really going to pass the mic over um, to two of my eighth grade science teachers. Um, I'm biased, but best and brightest in the district. And they're going to share a little bit about um, why the Colorado Middle Level Educators Conference is important to us and the work that we do at the middle level. And then uh, a little bit more about the sessions and how it aligns to the board and the strategic plan. Um, so I have with me Aaron Gantz and Julie Otis, and I'm going to pass it off to Julie. I am not one of the tall ones. Um, <laughs> next slide, please. Oh, oh, there's, wow, fancy hands. Okay, the Colorado Association of Middle Little Level Educators, um, we call it CAMEL, um, is um, important um, because it supports, it helps to support the needs of our young adolescents and our middle level learners. Um, because there is so much brain growth and brain change during that young adolescence, um, these or this organization and the conference um, helps to prepare us educators um, to navigate some of those um, changes and the unique learning needs of our middle level learners. Um, next slide, please. Oh, jeez, Louise. <laughs> she did. This is what she told me, and I put it in my notes. Um, so the conference theme was Adventures in Deeper Learning. Uh, we had two national presenters uh, present uh, keynote sessions on um, managing behaviors in middle level 
and also um, project-based learning. Uh, we also had some of our own uh, D20 um, educators present at uh, some of the breakout sessions, which Mrs. Gantz is going to tell us about um, later on here. Next slide, please. <laughs> I got it. Uh, I just wanted to highlight how this ties to the board ends um, because I think um, everything that we do as educational system in Academy School District 20 really does tie to the board ends. And so um, our goal in hosting the middle level conference was really to uh, focus in and hone in on the skills and knowledge that we want students to have as they become successful graduates of middle school and onto high school and ultimately um, enter the workforce and um, life. So um, all of our sessions were high quality and tied directly into developing students' knowledge and skills. Um, and also an uh, emphasis on the strategic plan that Academy School District 20 has in creating symbiotic and meaningful relationships. We made so many great relationships at this conference with St. Brain Valley Schools and some schools in South Aurora, um, as well as some national presenters who really are the experts in middle level S education um, and then investing in and valuing our greatest asset, our staff. Um, so often there's such a wide variety of professional learning opportunities and something really specific for middle school um, is just so valuable for our, our teacher population because we have some very unique um, challenges and successes at the ages of 11 to 14. Uh, and then all of the sessions I listed in very tiny font, please bust out your glasses. Um, but I just wanted to show you the diversity of sessions that were offered at this conference. You can see things all the way from professional learning communities, which I know is a focus for Superintendent Haber um, and building strong relationships and respect. And I think all of these sessions align in some way to either the board ends or the strategic plan for District 20. So I was really impressed um, in working with the conference folks. Uh, the heads of camel and their receptiveness to make sure that we're doing the right things right and having the right sessions that really align to the work that we want to see in our classrooms and schools. Um, specifically, some of our own very own educators were presenting at the conference. Um, so we had two presenters from Timberview or two groups of presenters from Timberview Middle School um, and then one from our district IT team actually. Um, and uh, we're just really proud of them for sharing their expertise and moving forward our vision of high levels of learning for all students. Um, so I'm gonna let Erin tell you a little bit about the sessions hosted by our D20 educators. I'm also very short. <laughs> So, but I'm loud and proud. Um, so when it came to our stuff, so first starters, um, the first session that we had was our PLC and how team struggles and how to help people. So we kind of did more of a workshop base because uh, we as, you know, the 20, we have the luxury of having our PLC late start. So we thank you for those because we love them uh, and they have really come in handy for us just because of the fact that I'm a little biased, but my PLC is seriously the best in the district because uh, they really keep me alive every day because I have a lot of hats and if it wasn't for them, then I wouldn't be able to do everything. Uh, so we were able to really talk to a lot of schools throughout the entire state of Colorado of what makes a really good PLC and how to keep those teams that are struggling and what could possibly help them out. And it was really, really neat to see. We had a lot of people that were in our session. It was great to see from the first year teachers to the 17 year veterans and seeing them all come together and really showing that there's value in everybody um, and how they can all be a part of a PLC and really make that work. Um, and Rowan was supposed to be here too, but unfortunately his kiddo was sick. Uh, so he also talked about utilizing universal design. Talk about that a little bit. Okay. <laughs> so my favorite thing that Rowan says is, imagine you're a chef. Universal design for learning is like this. Imagine you're a chef and you're cooking 32 meals for all of the different students in your classes. And everybody's looking at each other's food and they're like, oh, I kind of wanted what Superintendent Haberer had. Like, mine is not as good. And so universal design for learning, which is also what our IT team helped, IT team helped with, had a separate session on, is really about uh, letting students have some voice in the learning and the supports that are gonna best fit them. Um, and I think sometimes as educators, we get scared to, well, what if they pick the wrong support? Well, then you just have a conversation with them about 
you might be lactose intolerant and next time you need to try something else, taking it back to that chef um, analogy. So it was just cool to hear his reflections also as a neurodivergent learner um, and how some of the universal design for learning he implements in his classroom and supported him in his educational career. Um, so some really well done sessions by the best and brightest of D20. Um, thank you to our team and to the IT team for the amazing work you guys did. It was super impressive at that conference. Um, we are going to switch to STEM day, um, which was also super impressive and really the brainchild here, unless you have a question. I was going to say before you move on, I saw that Scott McLeod was one of your speakers. Yes. He was at the CASB conference on Friday before he came down here. He was our keynote on Friday. And so He's we got to hear him. He was he was phenomenal. So I grabbed some notes and we'll chat later. <laughs> awesome. Ms. Berman, I do have a question. So that was a statewide conference for middle school educators that was held at Timberview. Obviously, you guys played a huge role in that. Did how many other like how many of your teachers attended? What about teachers from other schools in D20? Did any of the other middle school teachers attend or was it just Timberview? I'm just curious how who the who, who was there? What was the attendance? Yeah, so there was over 150 educators actually from Colorado and Wyoming. Uh, Wyoming was the furthest. A lot of rural schools, which was interesting. I think we had like 10 or 11 teachers um, that day and there were some registrations from other schools, but I only counted my own. Chinook was definitely there. Um, Kyle Chamberlain was signed up from um, Aspen Valley campus. So a good showing from folks in our district as well. Yeah. Same day it is. Julie. October was a busy month at Timberview Middle School. Um, lots of Saturdays in a row. So Saturday, October 14th, we hosted our very first uh, STEM day. Um, it uh, originated from a Department of Defense workshop that was offered last spring. Um, we really do appreciate those workshops that are offered to us by our um, partners there. Um, and the, the workshop was at um, Peterson Space Force Base and the presenter there uh, had run a STEM day and kind of gave us some ideas and um, some resources to use for our, to do our own STEM day. Um, we chose to pair the STEM day with the solar eclipse um, because that's just a really, really cool thing for us science teachers. Uh, <laughs> and um, it is also really a neat thing to um, bring the community together, an easy way to bring the community together. And it is really fun to watch an eclipse with lots of people um, versus just your own family. Um, so as mentioned, we did be begin the event. Uh, Nature put on a spectacular show for us and it was fun to see all of, um, we probably had, we didn't take attendance or do a count, but based on eclipse glasses sold and some other metrics, we probably had between 300 and 500 people show. Um, and for our very first event, that's exciting for me. Um, we, <laughs> it's interesting to plan a first time because there's no model and it's, it, there's also no expectations. So there's uh, pros and cons there. Um, but they, nature did put on a spectacular show. It was a cold day, but it was just a beautifully clear day and easy to see the eclipse. Um, after the eclipse, we invited people into our building um, where we hosted different, uh, different um, community members. We did put it out to our parent community um, to see if they had any expertise in the, uh, the areas of STEM. And we had people, um, we had the Air Force participate. Uh, we had UC Health participate. Um, we had a former NASA scientist come. We had a mathematician from UCCS. Um, our science, our own science department put together sessions. And then we had our robotics teams also presenting. Um, and community members just dropped in and out of our presentation. It was very engaging, very hands-on, um, a very, um, positive light attitude towards science, um, but also um, just kind of helping um, kids know that there are careers in science and that there this is a pathway and um, just a fun thing to, that they may want to consider studying. Button? Okay, all right. 
All right, uh, so just to give you a little idea of some of the different presentations that we ended up having, uh, we had UCCS bringing a whole bunch of brains, and so the kids loved it. They got to touch the brains, and that was a lot of fun. Uh, so she was very hands-on. Rachel Levy, uh, she's been a part of our partnership with us for quite some time, and I think some of you actually saw her, uh, I think last year you came in and actually saw her presenting in my class. Uh, so we had her come back in, and she just did a remarkable job. So much that the kids wanted to touch those brains, she ran out of gloves, so we had fun like scurry to find her more gloves. Uh, and then we did have a uh, former NASA astronaut that came in and gave space food and they got to play space chess, which uh, is weighted more, so they stay down. So it's, it was a lot of fun seeing all the kids do that. Um, we had a chemistry magic show. That's always a fun one where the kids always got to do all kinds of fun stuff because we had the liquid nitrogen. Uh, so that's always fine because you get to, you know, freeze some things and seeing how they crack. And so that's always great. Uh, some of our own teachers at the school were willing to graciously offer a, a Saturday free of charge to help us out and do all this stuff as well. Uh, so we had our outdoor program, which is one of our very special exploratories that we have, that he had them um, doing animal tracking uh, and being able to identify animals based off of their tracks, especially for the ones that are in Colorado. So he got to showcase a little bit of that kind of stuff. Okay. And then we also had some awesome x-rays that were going on. So lots of hands-on things for the kids to be able to touch and play with. Uh, so you just, every room that you went into, the kids were playing and having fun and all you could hear is just excitement and all the neat things that were going on. And the people that were a part of it, they just were so excited to be there and just help out the kids and seeing them just shine. So it was really neat to see uh, and then we got to even showcase some of our own stuff, like the robotics team. Uh, they even had a silent auction for our robotics team, so they got to raise some money, which Karina can talk about here in a little bit. Uh, but then we also had our hot air balloons, and we had math there, because, you know, STEM can't go without math. So we got to make sure we include that, too. So we had so much stuff that was going on. And meanwhile, I was also running around with student council kids and uh, our National Junior Honor Society kids, and they were going around and helping give tours and show them what to go into. They were selling the kids on like, you need to go into this room. It's so much fun. And they were selling concessions and they were just having such a great time. So the time went by so fast. Um, it was really, really neat to see that there was actually, I personally got to meet up with a, a community member that he was outside walking his dog and he's like, what's going on out here? And he actually, and so we told him what was going on. He ran home, took his dog home and then came back and wanted to see the stuff. So it was really, really neat to see just even members of the community were able to see what was going on on a Saturday. Um, and so, I, so yeah, that just kind of goes with some of our other stuff. We had like other things like microscopes and all kinds of other fun stuff. The kids got to play with the robotics, so that was a lot of fun. Uh, and then we had the really, really big robotics. That that's a lot of fun, where the kids got to see all that stuff that was going on within there too. Oh, did I hit a button? Okay. Oh. 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 Sorry. Do you want me to go back? Okay, okay. Uh, so as we were also doing this and when we were coming up with this, it was really neat because we also got to build some more partnerships. Um, so getting the Department of Defense in there, all of our feeder strands, we sent out this flyer to all of our feeder strands with Liberty and all of our elementary schools. Um, lots of people showed up. And so it was really, really neat to see that. I mean, when we we all panicked a little bit at 930, we started at 10 and we all panicked at 930. Like, what if nobody shows up? We have people at the door ready to go in. So it was really, really neat to see and how many of them actually showed up. Um, and from the elementary schools, getting a chance to even get like a nice little sneak peek of what's going on at the middle school that you're going to come to. Uh, so, it, you know, that's what we're here for. We're here for the kids and just seeing a place where all the kids felt safe and the parents and just seeing all all the parents involved and seeing all the fun hands-on stuff it just really made it for a really good day um so i'll let you talk about that <laughs> awesome we use this opportunity also to fundraise because why not uh so we sold the eclipse classes and we raised just about a grand on eclipse classes 172 dollars on concessions our robotics uh program launched this year with first tech robotics i had a new teacher from texas come to me and he said miss beerman i am passionate about robotics and I want to do this. Um, in total, he's raised about seven grand for his robotics program. On this day, we raised $1,200 from a silent auction. We had partnerships with Shields who donated some gift cards, some restaurants around town. Um, there was a pizza party with a principal that my mom bought. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, so she paid $70 to see me, it's fine. 
uh, but a variety of really fun things and great ways to raise fun for our kids to have access to more opportunities. Uh, so our total income that day, if you will, was $2,665 that will go directly back to students learning about STEM and Timberview. So we're super proud of that. Um, and thanks for giving us some time today to showcase some really, really incredible teachers. If you ever have time, I encourage you to come by their classrooms. They are literally top notch. Um, so thanks for having us. We are done. So Timberview folks here in a minute, if you'll come up, we want to be able to get a picture with you guys and we'll take a break. And we also want to congratulate you on joining the team in a new position. All right.
we're back uh, live. And by the way, we have seven people watching remotely. Superintendent Haber, you have the floor again. Yeah, so um, lots of celebrations, and I know we've already had a, an hour of celebration, which is awesome. So I'll go through uh, some of my slides a little more quickly, but really do want to say thank you. Thank you to all of you as board members and your amazing support. Thank you to my amazing, um, really outstanding world-class cabinet. Uh, they are just, we're just really team one. Uh, I know that all of, so many of the successes that we've had together uh, been because of my amazing cabinet team. Our, we just saw our teachers and our principals. Uh, we just really are truly exceptional. So um, I just also want to thank Allison and her team. Uh, they've been kind of helping me keep track of some of the of what I had in my superintendent transition plan. And if it's okay with you, uh, this real video is really just a thank you in this season of gratitude, a true thank you to uh, all of our staff members for all of their support. So if you want to push play. Academy District 20 is truly a special place. My first 120 days exceeded my expectations. Just know that I love you, I'm excited about this year, and I just wish you a wonderful start to your year. I'm grateful for every single moment. Since my arrival, you have been a constant stream of support. Your encouragement and partnership have helped me achieve the goals outlined in my superintendent transition plan. Being in a classroom fills my bucket. I've been honored to spend time in your schools, share in your celebrations, and participate in your professional learning communities. I am eager to continue our work with multi-tiered systems of support and professional learning communities. And I'm excited to begin creating a district-wide portrait of a graduate. When growing high-performing teams, we must strive for continual improvement. Your honest feedback through the superintendent transition survey and at our coffee and conversations has already led to more targeted ways of communicating, trying different meeting structures and adding new stakeholder groups. Speaking of our stakeholders, I have learned so much from engaging with our business and community leaders. These important connections have resulted in new partnerships that will help us further our efforts to ensure all students achieve at high levels and find their passion. The board ends state that every student will have the knowledge, skills, and character necessary for a successful transition. Working closely with our board, we have modified our meetings and added study sessions, all to help ensure that we achieve our mission. Academy District 20, Team 1, thank you for your encouragement over the past four months. I'm grateful to serve as your superintendent, and I'm excited for what we will continue to accomplish together. Uh, to thank you to our community, our board members, um, our amazing cabinet, teachers, uh, principals. I'm just super excited. We really are team one and we're accomplishing so many good things uh, right from the beginning of the year. And again, a congratulations to Pioneer. Uh, we will be, uh, Allison and her team will be over there uh, to help them celebrate first thing in the morning uh, with some bagels and balloons and some other fun things. So, and thank you for the confetti today too. That was awesome. That was awesome. So I've had a chance, as I've shared in my Friday updates, to go to many different schools, and it has just been such a joy, and it really does fill my bucket to be in different schools and just to see the great things that really do happen here every day. So at High Plains, uh, at several of these elementaries especially, I've really been paying attention and have a deep appreciation for early childhood programs that we had. I've been to several of the preschools here at High Plains. I had a chance to go to their preschool program. Uh, they didn't care it was cold outside. They are out there having fun, uh, but really having learning opportunities through play. Uh, and uh, Principal uh, Dr. Craig Stevens also showed me the ways that his teams are collecting data and using it every week to make sure that we have intervention teams that are in place 
uh, to help all of our students succeed. At Academy International Elementary School uh, with uh, Principal Laura McNally. Uh, there she's standing by this board, and I thought this was brilliant. This is the um, PYP the, uh, that do the learner profile at the elementary level. So you could walk in and at kindergarten see the different types of units that they're working on and the topics that they're learning about. So as a, a parent, I could go and say, oh, my kindergartner is learning about uh, seeds and, and uh, plants, and so I could do that at home. Uh, so I like that way of, of really being transparent about the learning. Uh, again, got a chance to see some kindergarten and preschool uh, classrooms, and I couldn't resist but take a picture of the third grade team here. They were amazing and uh, just sharing a lot of the wonderful things that they were doing. At Woodman Roberts Elementary, uh, Principal Nate Hansen was super excited to show me their brand new uh, STEAM lab. Uh, and there, um, they had just opened it up, and these were also uh, some of our younger students, the cards are ways of coding uh, for the uh, robotic car, and the students were super psyched about that. Uh, Academy Endeavor Elementary School, I had a chance to walk around uh, with Principal Sheila Hansen, and she was also excited to show me their STEM lab. And there we have our younger students learning how to code, which I think is just incredible. At Challenger Middle School, uh, with Principal uh, Debbie Holt. Uh, it was really cool. They've got that large discovery uh, classroom where they can combine classes. To, so the sixth grade math teachers got together and they literally created a math escape room. And uh, you can see them busy doing all that math there on the tabletops, which the students loved writing on the table. Uh, and they were just running around and helping each other with math facts or and math problems, and they had to solve the problems to get the clue to go on uh, to try to, to uh, solve the mystery and to get to escape, and they had prizes for that. Over in the right left, uh, on the right hand corner is the counselors there, and they were amazing. They've got a special way of being able to ensure that they meet with every single student twice in the year just to check in, uh, see how they're doing, and make sure that they're receiving the supports that they need. Uh, and so it was just really a great day at Challenger. And then I too went out. Uh, well, actually, Friday night, I went to see Trap as well. And I'm really glad that several of us saw it because I need somebody to fully explain the ending. Uh, I followed it to the end, and then I didn't quite understand what caused um, all the everybody to kind of uh, rise up uh, at the end. So I would love to have that conversation. I'm like, I think I missed something right at the end with the glowing eyes and then the people dropping out of their seats. I don't know. Did you ever watch Inception? No. Well, it's the eyes glowing at the end was effectively the same as the top spinning at the end of oh, the movie. It's the persistence of the theme. Okay. All right, I'll follow that clue. Not really, but Maybe I'll look that one up. <laughs> so I too went to in the morning to see the high school marching band competition. Uh, and uh, this is Rampart and it was really cool. They did uh, Over the Rainbow and um, they covered themselves while they were playing in the cold uh, with this uh, beautiful green veil. And then right at the right time, they pulled it off. And uh, it was, I thought, very dramatic and impressive that they were able to do all that and keep a plane and moving around. Uh, and so uh, really enjoyed that performance. And then this is Air Academy. Uh, and I was so impressed again with the uh, trombone players up there on the uh, platform. Uh, and certainly they had different colored flags that were uh, being twirled around. It was just awesome, just really an awesome day. I had a chance to sit by an Air Academy parent and got a chance just to kind of hear just how important the marching band was for her son, especially her son was a freshman during COVID and uh, just really talked about some of the challenges that her son had along with some of his friends and how marching band was just a great way to bring the students back together and uh, that was really special, I think, for her to see her son out there. So I um, was able to give her a hug at the end, and then best of all, she shared her hand warmers with me So, because she was leaving, so I was able to kind of stay warm after that. Um, and yes, the English uh, as a second language night, uh, really uh, a huge shout out to Marta uh, Pan Panis. 
Penis, yes. She is the ESL teacher there. She reached out to me, I think, on my second day here in <laughs> Academy uh, District 20 and said, will you attend this night? And so I had on my calendar, and it was truly special, as uh, Nicole mentioned. And I think the real highlight for me is she had us uh, do all of these icebreaker mixer activities, which just very quickly created this sense of community. Uh, and I know I had some amazing conversations during dinner with some of the parents and just hearing about their native country and, um, you know, what some of their hopes were for their children here uh, in the United States. Then I, I've just had this amazing past couple weeks. Uh, I had a chance to go to Air Academy High School, the Air Force Junior ROTC. And really a huge thank you to um, Principal Dan Olson and Junior Air Force ROTC instructor, Colonel Robert Huber. Uh, wow, it was so impressive. We had students from all over uh, the district come. It was their briefing about all of the leadership experiences uh, that students experience. Uh, and what a great, great opportunity and something that uh, our district should be really proud of. Uh, as well as just the incredible students that were there. I asked them at the end to say, from the leadership experiences that you've had, what is one principle that you are taking away that you wanna apply? And that idea of community service and really looking out for the team and for building that sense of community, that was a theme that we heard over and over again. So just made me very proud. Again, Portrait of a Graduate has been a real highlight. Uh, just some great themes that we're already seeing emerge from these uh, sessions. As you know, we've had two sessions with students. We had our parent sounding board. Uh, we had our teacher council last night and we had our classified staff uh, this morning and we'll have our patrons council next week. And then we're gonna take all of that um, data that we've gathered. We'll be working with CEI, Colorado Education Initiative to help us pull that together and share it with, we're gonna be developing a steering committee that then will help look at all that data, develop some themes, we'll go out back out to some of these groups, ask for some more feedback. Uh, again, with the goal of coming up with that portrait of a graduate by the end of this year, uh, hopefully by April. But I really believe that the portrait of a graduate helps drive our board ends. And it's actually made me think that um, it may be, uh, once we look at some of the themes, it might be interesting just to go back and look at our board ends based on some of those themes and see if there's uh, some things we might wanna add or leave it the same. And we had fun in the EAC at, uh, during Halloween as well. Uh, and um, uh, Jim, Dr. Jim Smith was middle-aged Ken and I thought, well, then I'll just be brunette Barbie in that case. And um, but it was super fun and we had students from the village come over and do some judging. And down in the right hand corner is the group that won and they were paper jam. They dressed up as paper jam and uh, they are a print shop. And then up in the top left hand corner was our wonderful IT group that was just here and they were uh, servers. So, but you know, serving different things on their plate. Yeah, it was really cute and a lot of fun and really built that sense of community here in the EAC. In the middle were the zombies. Um, and of course, um, Mr. Smart there with his uh, HR group, all the different kinds of gnomes. Uh, it was awesome. And just really wanna just uh, end with again, a huge congratulations to the cross country team at Air Academy. Uh, this weekend, they won first place as um, Mr. Lavalley said in the 5A state championship. Five of their teammates came in in the top 10 and their performance on Saturday has broken the record for the fastest run ever run at Norris Penrose uh, in their team event. And we're really so proud of this team and their coaches and just can't wait to see what they'll do next. And that's the end of my report. And they've been running state at Norris Penrose for a long time. My son did it. He's 25, and he ran at Norris Penrose. So it's it's been there for a long, long time. So that that beating that record is is no small feat. That's great. All righty. Thank you, Superintendent Haber. I, I got to throw this out. We're talking about eclipses. Um, I went to the solar eclipse in Glenda, Wyoming, about six, seven years ago, and it was the coolest thing ever. If you get a chance, April 8th, 
There's one, it, it starts in Mexico and goes up through San Antonio, north, northeast, total eclipse. It's going to be really cool. I'm going to San Antonio, spend a night with my old college roommate. If you ever get a chance to be in totality, the difference between 95% and totality is like night and day. I mean, literally, uh, no pun intended. Seriously, if you, have, if you do get a chance, they don't come very often. Um, try to get to this thing April. It, it is a Monday, but um, I know educators, <laughs> I shouldn't be telling educators to go to this thing in San Antonio uh, on, on a Monday. And it's uh, perfect. Yeah, I, anyways. So consent agenda, we need a motion to approve the following resolutions. Uh, resolution 317-23, approval of matters relating to administrative staff classified. 318-23, approval of matters relating to licensed staff teachers. 319-23, approval of matters relating to licensed staff, comma, apprentices, licensed support slash special services provider. 320-23, uh, approval of matters relating to classified staff. 321-23, approval of extra pay position assignments, 23-24 school year. Approval of the Board of Education study session minutes from October 19th, 2023, and the approval of the Board of Education regular meeting minutes from October 19th, 2023. So moved. Second. Roll call, please. Mrs. Cloninger? Aye. Mrs. Cons? Aye. Mr. Lavalley? Aye. Mr. Salt? Aye. Mr. Temby? Aye. Okay, next is information items. A report of the Citizens Bond Oversight Committee, CBOC, Superintendent Haber. Uh, and that would be Ms. Becky Allen, Chief Financial Officer. Good evening. It's my pleasure to introduce the Citizens Bond Oversight Committee co-facilitator, Mr. David Brockway. <laughs> I don't have any slides, so. Um, Superintendent Haberher, I'm First time I've been at this meeting with you in person. It's a pleasure to meet you. Um, and just for background, I'm the co-facilitator of CBOC, the Citizens Bond Oversight Committee. The committee was formed in 2017 after the $230 million bond issuance in the fall 2016 election. I'm gonna report on monthly activity of the bond fund and then give an overview of where things stand today on the bond project as a whole. Uh, we met on October 18th, uh, Chris Garnhardt, uh, briefed us on financial activity for three months uh, that ended on September 30. Uh, July was not horribly eventful. There was a $36,000 increase in expenditures and encumbrances, and that was offset by interest earnings. October 31st, it got a little more interesting. Uh, we had an increase of 783,000 um, of expenditures and encumbrances uh, as compared to July, and that was the uh, order of the pre-engineered metal building at uh, the transportation expansion project. Uh, September, we had, uh, again, a small month of expenditures and encumbrances of about 53,000. This was mostly AV equipment for the pool at uh, Pine Creek High School and some wind jug treatments at uh, Aspen Valley, uh, Prairie Hills, and at uh, Woodman Roberts. Um, overall, the $230 million bond project uh, stands with about $14 million remaining to be completed. So about 95, 96%, somewhere in that area. Um, contingency fund at this point, 14 million of work to do, 1.2 million in contingency. Um, and that's uh, you know, money that is used for any possible overruns or things like that on those remaining projects. So we're encouraged that's about 8%. That contingency fund was funded initially with the bond project and then things like project savings or helping replenish it, sales tax rebates, um, which the bond office is very diligent about applying for and receiving slowly from the city. Um, those help replenish it and also interest earnings that I mentioned in some of those other early things. Um, so that's been a been a positive. Um, the upcoming work in that 14 million that remains is about a million seven of facility audit work, um, two large overhauls of pool projects, I believe in, in Rampart and Liberty are a lot of that million seven. Uh, technology infrastructure of about two million four, and then additional board approved projects, projects approved outside the bond language of about 6.6 .6 million. Um, the voters of D20 were promised back in 2016, among other things, two new elementary schools, Challenger Learning Center, a new middle school, uh, expansion and remodels at all the district schools, including TCA. Um, and these projects have been substantially completed and delivered. 
the building fund team, the Board of Education, district leadership can all be very, very proud of this accomplishment. And if I could just indulge for a second. Okay. <laughs> I, I was just too tempted when I came in. My, my wife and I have a deal. Um, I'm not supposed to make any jokes up here because she works for the district as a middle school teacher at Mountain Ridge. I did just to remain anonymous as the ESL teacher. Uh, but I, she didn't say anything about throwing confetti. So I thought I'd do that. Um, one thing I would note is that it's fun when we have our meetings, we talk about the various challenges that have existed out there externally since 2017 to 2023. Uh, boats getting stuck in the Suez Canal, uh, trade embargoes, COVID, inflation, supply shortage, supply chain interruption, you name it, um, a ton of challenges. And to deliver a project this magnitude on time, on budget is really something quite remarkable. I think, uh, again, congratulations to everybody involved in that. Um, and in addition, I want to point out that I mentioned the, the voters or the, the bond language projects that were approved and completed. There are things that have happened outside of the bond language projects that are worth note. The Village High School purchase and remodel, transportation center that's underway now, the Mountain Ridge Cafetorium, all made possible by efficient management of bond projects that we have and also timing of issuance of these bonds that commanded premiums out in the market that would be very difficult to replicate today under these conditions. But thankfully those things were delivered on to deliver the voters their promised projects plus. I think that again speaks highly of everybody involved. Our next meeting is gonna be in January and I'll brief the Board of Education soon after that. So I'll welcome any questions or comments. Mr. Temby. Well, having co-chaired this effort, uh, Dave, I can't thank you enough for your oversight um, and uh, the committee's work. Um, it is amazing with all the things that have happened that you've just uh, listed that we're still getting these things accomplished uh, on budget, plus some additional things, thanks to the proceeds on the bond and everything. So, but uh, thank you for your volunteer work on this issue. I know it takes time and a commitment, so thanks very much. Ms. Cloninger. Um, This is a project near and dear to my heart since I was also the co-chair uh, previous to you being there, and um, it was something that I took really personally. Um, I got harassed by this guy about budget on a regular basis <laughs> and was able to say um, wholeheartedly that we were on track and I think that as we look at things that are going on right now with MLO and opportunities to do things like that with our with our budget, we have to consider the fact that this has been the report throughout the last six years, that this is something that has continued to be the base of everything that we've talked about and the trust factor has to be there. It, in my opinion, just got an exclamation mark as you said that, as you said how close we are to finish, this is why our, tr our, our voters you know, can trust us because this has been handled very well. Becky and her team have been there throughout the whole thing. Chris and his team through the whole thing. You have been the one through the whole time, which is very impressive. So um, I just wanna say thank you for all of your work. Yep, Mr. Rockway, thank you. You, you I, Like my colleagues have said, you are one of the one of the few beginning, you've been here the whole time. And uh, the only one, I think? The first, yeah. That, keep showing up. Yeah, no, that's great, that's great. Um, you answered a, a, a couple, the one question I had was how much left money is still left in the board contingency fund? I think you said 1.2 1. 2, yeah. million. It is amazing to me how we're, we're going from initially 230 million and we ended up 265, I think we got total, 275. And we're, we're whittling that down. We're getting everything done. We're doing what we said we would do. We told the community what we would do and we've done it. And we're coming right down to the, to the bitter end and we're almost out of money and we're almost out of projects, which is exactly what you want to do. And, and I just, I salute everybody involved in this. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, Miss Allen and, and all, everybody who, who had a part of this. Um, when do we think we're going to be done? Finished, finished, do, do we know? 
I'm, I'm probably 12 months at a guess, but. OK. And it seems like you guys are a permanent committee, but but you are a temporary committee, the CBOC, and um, that committee will likely dissolve in a year uh, because there will not be a need for it. I'm not advocating anything here, I, but I, I think that's what happens when the money's all spent. We, we, we say thank you for your service and, and, and away we go. Um, so anyways, thank you. Uh, and again, yeah, this this shows that this district uh, spends money carefully, wisely um, and necessarily. There are things that we have to spend money on. I, I it's, we just do. Um, and we all know we still have three hundred million dollars of, of maintenance stuff that we that we backlog of maintenance that that we need to, to try to get done. It's it's tough. I wish there were more money, so thank you. Oh, Mr. Salt. If you keep showing up, we'll have confetti for you in December. Thank you. Appreciate that, sir. <laughs> uh, building fund update, Superintendent Haber. Yes, and uh, Chief uh, Financial Officer Becky Allen. Mr. Brockway, thank you so much um, for being on that committee from the get go. It's a pleasure to work with you and um, the folks that you mentioned are the reason and Chris Garnhart is a huge reason. Uh, for the success of the building fund. So it's my pleasure to welcome him to the podium, our executive director for building fund. I think we need another. This this is the UIP that's up here. We need another. Yeah, I'm I'm not. Chris, did you want to go ahead and take it? There we go. Sorry about that. So well, well, thank you. Uh, I know there was a question about the pool, so let me give you a quick briefing on the pool. Uh, we had a little warranty issue that we're in the process of taking care of. There was a cracked pipe that is what we call the makeup water line to the surge tank in the pool that's under the concrete deck around the pool, not in the pool, that, uh, that we're in the process of replacing. So we had to take out some of the concrete deck. Uh, they've taken the pipe, the broken portion of the pipe out and they're pressure testing it now. They'll get it repaired and then they have to backfill it. It was probably about five or six feet deep. Um, yeah, <laughs> they all, all dug by hand is what they had to do. And then um, they'll pour the deck back in and we'll get that pool back online here. Probably uh, about three weeks out is probably what it's looking like earlier if they can get that. Uh, it's just one of those unfortunate situations when we had the pool up and running before we got a certified pool operator at the school, we wouldn't let the school use it anyway. And something didn't seem right to us. So we had them put a camera down that pipe and that's when we saw the, the crack in the pipe and uh, we just made the decision to just go ahead and repair it now. We could have waited till the summer, but uh, we thought it would just be better to get it done. So that's just a, a, a bet. I don't have anything in my presentation on anybody. Sure. Board on that because there was a question. And thank you for addressing that. Um, was there any other issues of the foundation no, not being? No, no. That's just rumor. Uh, there might be some other rumors. Okay. <laughs> the, the pool, it was just walls in the floor. Uh, and the structural components of the pool itself are all fine. There's nothing wrong. And is the the company that built it honoring the warranty? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. They don't. They, it's a very reputable company. Good. It's been in business for 75 years here in the state of Colorado. They're they're not gonna they're not gonna shag out on it. That they wanted to jump in and take care of it. Right okay, away. good. So we had to give them the go ahead before we said, hey, it's good to do it now versus in the summer. Okay, I appreciate it. Any Thank other you about no. that at all. Chris, can I add one thing? What was interesting that I learned during that process is they attempted to fix the pipe with a snake, you know, via a camera, but it just required. And and maybe well, that's part of the rumor, you know, when you well, see some concrete being displaced, uh, that that might be it. But it was um, actually the, the the repair we tried initially uh, just for a temporary basis is a liner that they put in there, and then they have a chemical that takes this liner and actually welds it to the inside of the pipe. So it actually could be a permanent fix. And what happened is, as they pulled it through uh, in one portion, it twisted on them. And so that, that, wouldn't, that just wasn't gonna work, but. Uh, Mrs. Allen, that was not the Liberty High School snake you were talking about, right? <laughs> no, what was her name again? Harriet. Harriet, yeah, no, not Harriet in there. <laughs> All right, well now let me get on to some more positive things here for y'all. All right, let me jump right into the facilities audit project. So uh, we still have uh, the Rampart and Liberty uh, swimming pool upgrades to do. One of the reasons we haven't started the Rampart pool project is we don't want to have 
we want to make sure we have two pools up and running. So as soon as we get Pike Creek up, we'll start on Ramparts. And then after Ramparts, we'll, we'll go to Liberty. Uh, right now, we're projecting a late November, early December start for the Rampart. Uh, obviously, we'll gauge that on what happens there at uh, Pine Creek. And then we have some replacements at win of windows at Aspen Valley Middle School, Prairie Hills Elementary, and Woodman Roberts Elementary. Uh, those windows are in order. They should be arriving for Prairie Hills and Woodman Roberts any day. And we'll target putting some of those in winter break and probably finish them up in spring break time frame is what we're looking at. Uh, and then we're working with the facilities management team. We don't have a lot of money in the facilities audit budget, but uh, remaining, but there will be a few other smaller scale projects that we'll do, and I'll brief you on that once I know what those are. Hey, Chris, yeah. once once the pools are down, like the rampart pool, how long is that? A those are about four month projects. Yeah, if uh, if you were to go out to there to either one of those schools, Rampart or Liberty, the pool equipment's down in a pit, right. and they're in a real small room, area, and so the the workspace is very very confined. So it just takes some time to get through them. I'll have pictures when we get to that at some point in time. And then we get on to the, the showcase project that we currently have going on, and that is the cafetorium at Mountain Ridge Middle School. So this is the exterior of it, uh, what it was a couple of, about two weeks ago. Uh, so they have all the exterior walls up, the roofs on, the masonry's in place. And then this is a view from me standing right next to a temporary wall and taking a picture of the stage, if you will. Uh, I think by now the drywall is finished and it's painted. Uh, I know they're in the process of finishing that up. And I think one of the benefits that we got out of this project, uh, uh, luckily, was we, we, if you remember, the existing stage area was sunken. Well, we filled that in and so it expanded the, the cafeteria, but it also created an additional space that they could use for a classroom if that's what they wanted to use it for. But we were, uh, originally we were gonna patch the floor, but we were able to replace the entire floor in the cafeteria. So we made that all look new. And then the transportation expansion project. So uh, right now we're at about a 70% completion on the design. Uh, we should finish that up here in the next two to three weeks. And then we'll get a final contract price and then start that project uh, probably in December, January. Uh, as Mr. Brockway stated, uh, we ordered a pre-engineered metal building. And so if you're looking at this drawing off to the right side, that, that's where the metal building will be. So it'll be to the east of the existing transportation building, and it will house the bus maintenance operations. Uh, the areas in purple that you see in the drawing on the left, that'll be freed up space from relocating the maintenance portion of that, uh, and that'll create a new larger dispatch area for transportation folks, as well as a driver's uh, meeting area, lounge, something like that. And these are just in large floor plans of it. So you can see, yes. Uh, is there a reason why the Bay 8 is two feet wider than the other ones? Is there a different size bus that needs that or? No, uh, I think it has to do with, uh, we had to have an exit door out of that point, a man door. So a three foot wide exit door, that's why. Thank you. Good question, though. And then that's kind of what it's going to look like on the outside. I think I've shown you this picture in the past. Mr. Garner, yes. Um, mandates being what they are, um, are we going to wire this thing for electricity in case we have to get electric buses? So here's what I can tell you what I know about electric buses. I think what you're going to refer to is the charging stations where you charge. Them. That's what I'm accurate. That's what I mean. That's going to be out in the uh, parking lot where the buses would be not in the building. So it's not really a part of the scope of the work. And I would tell you that it's probably a very expensive. Oh, I know. Project to upgrade the electrical to do that. I did a little research on it. I just know it requires an awful lot of electrical power to charge those buses. And the buses cost triple a, a commission. Yeah, yeah, they're very I remember going to a <laughs> thing. It's been, yeah. I, I just wondered if, you know, since we're digging stuff up and, and I just just know how mandates can be. So we just got to think ahead. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank I you. think that one, uh, it's probably possible that you wouldn't have to tear up a bunch of asphalt. That's my guess. Probably upsize some wiring because there are, uh, I'm going to call it some poles out where the bus is parked now. And there's some electrical out there, but it's probably not adequate to charge a bus, but they, they plug the buses in uh, in the wintertime for their block. Oh, the block, sure. Yeah. Sure. Yep. Yeah. That makes sense. Thank you. Okay. 
And then uh, on the IT side of things, we received the core network switches. They've arrived and they're being installed. And then we're continuing to work on the document scanning project. Any more questions? Thank you, Mr. Garnhart. Right. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. The District Unified Improvement Plan, Superintendent Haber. Yes, uh, Dr. Susan Field, Assistant Superintendent for Learning Services. Good evening, everybody. Um, did you put their handouts on there? I did bring them private. So, sure. yeah. So we're going to be referencing those in the next couple minutes. So JoLynn's going to start us off. So in your packet of handouts, the first one is um, in a little bit. We're going to be going through the Unified Improvement Plan, and that just gives you a version that you can look at from your current position. So just a little bit of background and information. Um, the Unified Improvement Plan is something that we have to do by um, CDE and for um, the state. It is focused on improving student learning through the continuous improvement process. So we talk about that all the time. And that is completed through the Unified Improvement Plan process as well. And so we're going to walk through some of those pieces tonight of what that looks like. So the next slide looks at CDE has a template that we are required to use. So the district as well as our schools write a unified improvement plan. And so these are just an overview of the areas that are discussed within the improvement plan. So a brief description of the district or the school that we're looking at, a review of prior year targets. So this document is created a lot based on the district performance framework or the school performance framework. So we've walked through that, we're familiar with those pieces. And so looking at that data and information, we're really targeting the areas where we might be approaching or not meeting an expectation. And so that's an area that we're focused on. So we're reviewing those prior targets. Um, we're highlighting our current performance. And so one of our pieces that we include is local data. So our map growth data, our schools have to submit um, read data. So we've talked about um, it's not Dibbles anymore. Dibbles 8. Uh, no, Dibbles 8. <laughs> They've changed the name. I'm like, sorry, that assessment so many times. I'm like, how to keep up with that? Dibbles 8. Um, and then they sent future targets. So they set targets for the following year. They actually set them for two years. Because schools and districts, if you're um, in a performance plan or or higher, you do not have to write yearly. We have the option to submit biannually. And so by writing those goals that last over a two-year time span, we're meeting that um, requirement and piece. They look at, and we're going to look at these pieces here in just a second within the district improvement plan, the major improvement strategies. What are we going to do? What areas are we focusing on? Root causes. So if we were to address whatever that root causes, we would be able to eliminate the need for that major improvement strategy. And then what action steps are they going to implement for um, the improvement plan? So in the district, as I just shared. Um, Mr. Temby. Well, then before you dive yep. in here, <clears throat> I think it's important for people listening to understand this is a holistic view of the district where the rubber hits the road for all these UIPs at the school level. Because if we can bring up the performance of ones who are lagging, obviously that bolsters the entire ship here, right? Absolutely. So this is kind of a holistic view of root causes and some macro looks at this data. But the UIPs and the work of the DAC is incredibly important, right? Absolutely. So for the district tonight, we're looking at the district overview and what the district's focusing on. Schools have done the same type of activity and provided the same type of background and information. And you're absolutely correct, Mr. Temby, this, this ties very closely to the work we're doing this month at DAC, where we're looking at site plans, we're looking at the district performance frameworks, we're looking at all these pieces tied together to see how um, our schools are aligning those pieces as part of the accreditation process that Dr. Field and any of us get to work with. So in District 20, we talked about, we, we and the state requires this, but we're looking at our district and school performance frameworks. We're doing a lot of data analysis, so we do that information early on. It's definitely a collaboration. So what I shared um, recently is that 
Dr. Field and I have the opportunity to share this with you, but this is the work of our entire learning services team and our departments across the district. We don't do this alone. We also invite our principals. We've invited um, several principals to weigh in and give us feedback on what our plan looks like, what things would they add, what things would they change. So thinking about that collaborative piece, and then this just notes the last bullet there, notes that the biannual submission is an option for our schools that are um, on performance or higher plans. So what we're gonna do now is walk through some of the pieces to the plan. So that first handout that you have is what I kind of invented as the stakeholder version, the document because of the formatting that CD, and it's the first one in your packet that I handed to you that's paper clipped. It was paper clipped. Um, the, um, the, because of the formatting that's used in this template, the full plan is about 50 pages long. So to print that and carry that around and present at stakeholder groups, it's a little overwhelming. Plus the way it's laid out, it's it's just a little more confusing. So I've tried to make this a little easier on all of us to have a better understanding. So when we look at priority performance challenges, at the district level, we know we're addressing the entire district. So we are gonna have areas in English language arts and math where our subgroups are not performing the same level as their peers. And so that's why our major improvement strategies at the district level are written, written very large in order to support that work and those pieces of information. So then what we're gonna do is Dr. Field and I are gonna walk you through the, the stakeholder version that I've given you. You'll notice that there's three sections. Um, first, with the carrot next to it, you will see the, the major improvement strategy itself. So for instance, the slide that's up right now is major improvement strategy number one. You'll see that strategy. You'll see the root causes first. So if those were things that we could change, we would be able to improve this area and then the action plan and the action steps that are gonna go with it. So Dr. Field and I are gonna collaborate and share some of this information with you. Okay, so the handout, we love this handout. I, uh, Jolyn and I shared it at DAC um, earlier in October as we're in, in preparation for our big accreditation review coming up in two weeks. But I think for um, our parent community, our staff, it's just a quick, easy snapshot and we try to write it in layman's terms so people can understand. So our first major improvement strategy, like Jolyn said, we're focused um, at a district level. So we're looking at ways that we can support our all schools. And our first major improvement strategy is around effective implementation of professional learning communities and the MTSS structures. So when we talk about root causes and maybe why we're not fully there yet, we have identified shared ownership for accountability. We're still working on this whole idea around a guaranteed and viable curriculum for all students in our schools, instructional practices, and then systems and structures. And we see PLCs and MTSS structures as essential for um, high uh, student learning in our schools. So I'm not gonna uh, talk you through every single one of our um, implementation benchmarks, but I'm gonna highlight a few. So the first one is number 1A, which is utilize a district strategic implementation guide for PLCs. So JoLynn included in your packet a document that looks like this. It's the second document. And this document was created um, among the learning services team. And this is a document that we use with our schools to determine how schools are implementing professional learning communities. So principals and their teacher leaders and their PLCs will sit down together and kind of self-assess where they are on this rubric. Because we want gold standard professional learning communities, we need a rubric or a guide to show us what that looks like. So we created what we call anchor statements and each anchor statement has key indicators. And so a lot of the PSSG team has sat down with principals and kind of walked through so where are your strength areas? Where are areas that you still need support or that you're still working? And as you can imagine, we have some schools that have all teams and departments that are doing very well. And then we have some schools that, you know, oh, these two departments are doing well, but this is a department that still needs support. And also remember, we hire 250 new teachers every single year. So there's always a learning curve and an onboarding process 
for new staff in schools. And then sometimes principals, especially at the elementary level, will completely redo a whole grade level. And so you'll have all new teachers on a grade level sometimes. But this um, implementation guide is super helpful for our schools. And we, we, when we go out and do coaching, we use that as our roadmap. Another thing I wanted to highlight was professional learning for leading PLCs for principals and administrators. Um, today, uh, Andy Ruskin and I and Brian K. Spear got to present at the Equity and Excellence Conference. I think we shared with you in the spring when we were sharing our REDAC data that CDE invited us to present because they were so impressed with our growth data and our REDAC data. And this conference was focused heavily on instruction. So they wanted us to come down and talk about tier one instruction. So we went today and uh, Brian K. Spear talked and I, uh, you'll see in your board newsletter tomorrow, I actually included the, our PowerPoint that we used, um, talked heavily about leadership. And, and I think I've shared with you all before too that principal leadership is critical. And um, so we have invested a lot of time and resources in our principals so that they can lead this work in their schools. Because if they're not invested and they don't have the knowledge, professional learning communities will not be successful. Another piece, um, which is uh, 1B is data cycles with principals by level. Each, each quarter we uh, at, with, at principal level meetings, we go into data. So it might be map growth data, it might be behavior data, it might be CMAS data, it might be REDAC data. Thank you, Jolene. And we have principals bring friends with them. So we have them either bring like a dean or if they wanna bring their assistant principal or their MTSS coordinator, or whomever, whoever helps lead these conversations with teachers in our schools. We actually go through a data protocol and that's another document that I threw in there today. We shared this today up in Denver, but we ha I included a data discussion protocol and I know we throw a lot of lingo at you all. And so sometimes it's nice to have something to hang on. So this is actually one of the data discussion protocols that we use with schools. It's called the here's what, so what, now what? protocol and it's a super easy protocol for teacher teams to use and I just wanted to share a copy with you. And then also um, another focus area, ensure that all schools have completed identifying priority standards for ELA math and science and I can't overstate how important um, identifying priority standards are which is a core essential work of teachers. I was doing some site planning earlier this week with one of our schools and um, there was about 18 or so staff members. It was Mountain Ridge. Uh, it was a fabulous um, time together and they were talking about um, common formative assessments and some of the teachers and not all, some departments are further ahead like, oh, we've done all this standards work. Other departments, like I said, who might have newer teachers or are just working together for this first time still needed to do that work. So that's a huge focus area for us, is ensuring that all of our schools have completed identifying priority standards. And then if you go to the second page at the top, we, t we really emphasize the collaboration piece of all specialists meeting together to talk about students. It's super important if, if we're gonna ensure that students get the right interventions or support they need. We need um, special ed at the table. We need talented and gifted at the table. We need uh, our English language learner teachers at the table. It's critical. And then finally, um, here, number two, the full implementation and shared vision model framework for the MTSS or multi-tiered multi system of supports. And that's the third handout that is with you. You can see it's the inverted triangle. And this is the one that I think we have shared with you before. Um, Brian K. Spear really walked through this today. Um, he really talked a lot um, today about universal screening and diagnostic assessments when we were up um, in Denver today. So this is also just a reference point for you. Okay, Jolene's going to go into the second strategy. So the next strategy that we're going to look at is utilizing student data to prove, improve instruction. I feel like I get an opportunity to talk to you about this a lot, so that's good news. Um, and so really it's looking at, we 
want to inform instructional decision making through this use of data. So it's one thing to collect it all, have access to it, have it in those visualizations that make our work easier. But then it's like, what are we going to do about it um, once we have this data and information in our hands? And so we feel like that's an area that we're working to be stronger in. And so um, one of the first areas is protocols. So looking back at the protocol Dr. Field just shared a few minutes ago was an example. Um, we have a ton of different protocols that we support schools with, we support the principals with, and then they also do their own collection of looking for different ways to talk about the data and then how to decide what they're going to use it for. A next piece of this is you'll see that two, three, and four really focus on training. They focus on the areas of those tiers. So when you think of multi-tiered systems of support, um, tiers one through three. And so number two really looks at those instructional practices for ELA and math. Number three really looks at our social and academic behaviors. We've talked a lot about the need for student behaviors this year and how we can support our schools in those areas. And then how to train staff to use the data for individualized and effective plan development. So when we think about that, we think about students who might be on an individual education plan, which is an IEP, or a student that might have an ELL, an English language learners plan, um, or a gifted and talented out plan. And so how can we help staff to really write those goals and those plans um, to best support the needs of students? And then the last three on this data piece really look at some um, specifics around special education with a focus. So one of those is the number five would be providing training for staff focused on access strategies. So how can we help kids access education that's happening in the general education classroom in that tier one first time instruction for all students? And then number six looks at um, so when we think about assessments, we talk a lot about accommodations, but often students receive modifications or specifically designed instruction. And over the last few years, we've brought in um, professional learning for our staff focused on that and for our schools. And then the last one speaks to ensuring that service delivery models for students with disabilities align with, we often hear the term FAPE, which is free appropriate public education and that continuum piece. What I just realized is I zoomed past root causes <laughs> so we could go back and say so remember root causes are those adult behaviors things that if we were to improve that we would see less of a need for these areas so progress monitoring we've talked about how do we monitor the needs of students our instructional practices and expertise and analyzing data progress monitoring systems so one of the pieces right now that is less highlighted here, but part of our math committee work is looking at progress monitoring tools and we're piloting some tools right now in the district. And we're also doing, I'm trying to decide what it's gonna be called. I think about it kind of like a vendor fair where we're putting together a survey for all of our schools because some schools have purchased their own tool and we want to learn more about it and see if there's a tool that we could all um, utilize for the best of our students. And then really that professional learning piece is something that we focus on all the time um, in learning services. And then how can we help our educators write those specific plans for students? So plan development. And yeah, no, you're sorry, you got halfway over. <laughs> so I was like, what's next? Okay, finally, our last major improvement strategy is around supporting the whole student, so improving student wellness to positively impact student learning and a sense of belonging, which you know is one of the um, objectives in the strategic plan. So root cause around why this is a focus area for us. Um, we know in our community that there's a lack of mental health support for students in our community. Um, we also have shortages of staff and increased need of services for students. We also have an increased number of students being suspended and expelled in our district. Um, you've probably heard if you visited schools, perhaps we, we definitely have an increase of behaviors. And then finally, just a lack of support systems for students with basic needs, food, clothing, shelter, that type of thing. So the few things I wanna highlight, um, number one around implementing the district, the district strategic plan to promote a sense of belonging for all students, staff, and community of stakeholders. You know one of our values is around building relationships, and this is heavily where we focus on building relationships with our students. And all staff have a goal in this area. 
We also provide a lot of professional learning for staff, and that's where we have really focused our efforts here in supporting the whole student is really supporting our staff who support our students. So you can see in number two, uh, we have about five things listed. We do a lot more than just this, but we have trauma-informed practices, suicide prevention awareness, social and emotional wellness, belonging, and youth mental health first aid. And finally, uh, on the third strategy or um, action step here, we continue to work through and look at innovative and evidence-based practices. So we have instituted a behavior team in Academy District 20 to support students in gen, gen ed and in special education um, through a referral process. And so a principal can call and say, um, we're struggling with the student behavior. And so um, the behavior team is under Belinda's department. We have, I think, two, correct, Belinda? Two. And they will go out. It's a comprehensive team that will go out and do some observations and provide strategies for teachers. Of course, we have our counselors at the Family Resource Center, and they are available to our counseling staff in our schools that, can't, that don't have the time to provide the support that students might need. And then um, we have students will be instructed on the Colorado standards around social emotional wellness through their pre K-12 journey. And then finally, um, we have uh, implemented systems for staff to refer students and families in need to our special populations team. So that's where we have our community liaison that works with our um, parents that uh, might need additional support with any name, any number of things in our community, but we also have our Family Resource Center, which has our food bank and our clothing closet there as well. So that is a really quick snapshot of our 55 page UIP. What questions can we answer for you? Mr. Temby. So as I was looking through these three strategies, um, what struck me about three is it's really the other side as we look at MTSS. These are concurrent activities. They're not linear. They're not like we achieve one, we move on to the next. This is this is a key part. And if the whole child's not going up or down that pyramid um, at the same pace, um, obviously that that's a concern. And so this is an intervention. It's not just a post-pandemic thing. It's just something you you got to be concerned about. Uh, at any time in history, which is the, how safe and secure uh, a child feels, uh, how their mental health is, and are they prepared to learn? And so um, this is an important one and doesn't have any more inflection than an academic one. They're all, they're all side by side here. So, Ms. Kahns. I just wanted to thank you guys for the additional handouts. Um, because, you know, I know the board is supposed to be the 30,000 foot overview, big vision, but I'm a details person and, you know, I'm always asking guys, so what's the next step? Jolyn, Jolyn has the line now about like, now what do we do with it? You know? <laughs> and so I just love actually seeing the protocols and the SIG and all this, you know, detailed questions that we're going through. And so I'm just thrilled to see more of the process. So thank you for sharing. Yeah, and we can do that at any time. Yeah, yeah, so I, I appreciate it. And very cool about the behavior team here at the EAC to go out and yeah, and go help teachers that are at wit's end sometimes when they don't know what else to do. So awesome, thank you. My only comment was uh, regarding uh, major improvement strategy three. We just need to make sure that parents are completely in the loop. That this is uh, a real big, parental involvement type of things. Uh, do you guys want to comment on, on that? Um, really, it's our principals and our school's jobs to communicate with families about what's occurring in their school, and I believe they do an excellent job. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Next is the 20. Hi. <laughs> oh, sorry. Thank you, ladies, both. I'm sorry. I did. Um, the 2023 CASB Fall Conference and Delegate Assembly Debrief, Mr. Salt. Thank you. I'm going to take my time so I can start with Mr. Timby here. Um, 
kidding. I'm kidding. Easy. All right. So uh, we had the CASB delegate assembly back beginning of October. Uh, Mr. Timby spoke a little bit about the bylaws side of that um, from his perspective at the last meeting. Um, one thing that I want to bring up regarding the bylaws before I jump into the actual resolutions was um, we will approve the bylaws or work to approve the bylaws at our business meeting in December uh, at the CASB conference here. So we've already gotten a copy of that. I think actually CASB sent out, I think to everybody. So everyone should have had a copy of those bylaws. So with that being said, if you have anything you'd like to see changed or looked at or discussed, uh, let me know. I already spoke with Mr. Timby about a couple of things. One of the things that we want to try to change, this seemed to be a pretty common refrain from the delegates that were at the assembly back in October was that the quorum level for what constitutes a quorum at the um, at the assemblies was too low. Uh, they have it currently set at 20%, which when you think about the number of districts in the state and how many actually can show up to some of these things, it gets to be a very small number. And so that's one of the things that pretty much everyone was looking to, to increase. We don't make it difficult, um, but I think we were talking somewhere in the 35, 40% uh, to try to get that up. Where did you guys come down on the, um, you know, uh, not absentee, but that they could be remote call in? So that's that another part of that. It's not so well. Call in would be part of the quorum. That's what I was. Wondering. Yeah, um, but nothing changed regarding verbiage about remote voting in the bylaw change. I don't know if Mr. Timmy want to speak to that. Or I can. I know we had some conversation about it. Yeah. Okay. Um, the idea being so. For those of you without background information, up until last delegate assembly, it came up that. Uh, remote voting was not permitted. We have a lot of rural districts who can't afford to come and travel across the state. We have some of the rural districts, actually one of the CASB board members uh, has a farm out in the Peyton Calhan area, and he was uh, harvesting corn up until it was time for him to leave to come to the delegate assembly in Glenwood. And so when you talk about some of these individuals who are sitting on these boards and are representing their districts, they don't have the time to come and spend an entire weekend in the fall to do this. And so we're at the December meeting, business meeting last year, we actually, that's actually what sparked the bylaw review was trying to look at a way to provide remote options for districts and for uh, delegates to be able to participate, to increase that number. Because I would say last year when we were, when I was there, we probably had 65, 70 people. We were in Denver. This year we were in Glenwood Springs and we actually had closer to 100 represented because we had about 20, 25 that were remote, if I recall, and then a handful that were, you know, everyone else was in person. At the business meeting in December, we decided that the interpretation of the bylaws did not exclude remote voting and so that we didn't have to change bylaws to allow remote voting. And so that's why we did it this past assembly without changing the bylaws. And so that's my understanding is sort of where the decision to not change the bylaws came from to explicitly permit or allow the remote voting for delegates was because the bylaws already allow for that with the interpretation. You know, this is exciting stuff, um, but the, um, and I think the glossary was going to be rechecked to make sure that attendance, the definition of attendance uh, showed the remote voting and the glossary was an addition to the bylaws that never existed before. So, but that's a big deal. Yeah, it's, it's yep. a, and so this is the first time in how long that since the bylaws were last reviewed. Do you remember? 20 years. 20 years. So not that anything's changed technologically or culturally in 20 years to need bylaw changes. Um, anyway, so all that to say, you should have copies in your inboxes from CASB. If you don't, I can afford it because I know I have a digital copy. Uh, please take a look and let me know. And um, feel free, I've already bugged Mr. Timby a handful of times about you know, a couple of things that were in there just to see what the rationale was behind it. So um, yeah, we're off to, I think it's a really good product that the bylaws committee came out of so i appreciate your your work on that all right now to the resolutions the exciting part of the whole thing um i'm not going to talk about every resolution if there's one that you want to chat about let me know i'm going to chat about a few of these 
Uh, first, I'll start with the standing resolutions. Um, the standing resolutions, the ones that we have kind of year over year. Um, what we did is in the local governance section. So that's uh, SR seven and through nine. We actually added those got amended to include the reference this in the state constitution, Article nine, Section fifteen, that gives local control to school elected school boards. And so we explicitly put that reference in those resolutions. I think that's all. I'm not going to spend much time on the consent. Consent passed. There were only a couple that were pulled and those still passed anyway. So all of consent passed. Um, oh, we did make an amendment uh, as discussed last time. Uh, consent agenda resolution number 11. We pulled that one and that was the one that said we needed independent oversight of the early childhood department of ed. And we wanted to utilize the State Board of Education since they're already an elected body to that oversees the CDE. Uh, that amendment passed and then the resolution passed. So we were able to get our language in there about making sure that it had uh, that we wanted to use the existing body instead of create a different one. Uh, resolution 12 or I guess it's 13 because there was a change in my packet was old. catch up over here. Uh, it was actually withdrawn. It was one that we were going to oppose um, related to the universal screeners for reading and math. So they withdrew that one and wanted to change and work about it a different way. Uh, there was some state legislation that they were referencing as to why they wanted to pull that. Uh, it was resolution 12 in the package that we received initially and discussed at the last meeting. Um, it became number 13 because there was some there was a change. There was an additional resolution added to the consent, so everything else got shifted up. So if you look in the final packet that you were given, there's actually not a 13 and that's why it's because it was drawn. The PTEC. Um, resolution. It was resolution number 15 in the if you're looking at the final packet, uh, we presented an amendment uh, that said that we wanted to increase the flexibility and promote innovation for work based learning and then make it more. Uh, to make it more accessible to districts across the state uh, that amendment passed and the resolution passed. The Resolution on social studies was withdrawn, so that would have been number 17 in your packet. But you'll see that it's missing. And HB or resolution 19 related to HB 1110. Ms. Kuzer is not here, but we did get our change. We actually changed it to the three years to give additional time, and they had made an additional amendment to that the authors did at Pooter. Um, they had an additional bullet point at the top that basically adopted or it's at the bottom of the bullet here. Uh, that adopted the federal rules for accessibility since those already exist at the federal level that they're saying if we're talking about this and we don't have the rules developed yet, why don't we just ask the legislature to use the accessibility rules that are already in place for this type of information? That amendment passed as well. Um, the minimum wage change, there was a uh, resolution number 23 that wanted to change the minimum wage of teachers across the state to 45,000. That resolution was rejected, did not pass. It was one of the few that did not make it. Um, we had a lot of the rural districts that were complaining about how difficult it would be to make that happen. Uh, there was actually a lot of conversation around um, what was included in that minimum wage uh, rate. So if you 
saying $45,000, does that include any stipend if you have district provided teaching, uh, district provided housing for teachers? Does that not include that? So there's a lot of dialogue around what does the 45,000 actually mean, but ultimately the burden that it would have placed on districts across the state to try to match that and the ripple effect of, because it's not just raising that minimum wage to 45,000, you have to hit other teachers as well and other employees to, to raise those. And the ripple effect honestly would have been crippling to a lot of districts. And so the weight of that um, caused it to get rejected. The resolution number 29 uh, presented by Calhan was the support for school district construction impact fees. That was one that we were supportive of. It's one that I know um, D49 has talked about quite a bit. That one passed. There was only one dissenting vote <laughs> in that one, um, but it passed. And so that was, uh, it's one that I think would be really good if we could get that going at the legislature. The cell phone use was, believe it or not, not a unanimous vote. That actually had quite a few dissensions, but um, it did pass. Uh, and that was just to increase fines for cell phone use during a school zone. I'm not sure why. I don't know why there were people that were not pleased with that, but there were. Uh, <laughs> like those are the violators that don't want to get caught and don't want to pay more. Um, resolution number 32 that was presented by Boulder Valley. That was the updates to Cora. That one passed. We had presented a, an amendment to eliminate the third bullet that said prioritize requests made by legit, legitimate media outlets. And so our amendment passed and pulled that out. A lot of the rationale that was provided, not just by me, but others was there's nothing that precludes you from giving that already. You know, you can prioritize whoever you want to if you have accurate media in there. But there's also times that people don't necessarily want to respond to a story. And so they can utilize that however they want to. So um, that was, so the core changes passed. Hopefully the legislature will listen to that one because that's one that I know a lot of, a lot of districts would be excited to have a, a little bit more breathing room on that one. The uh, resolution 35 was guardrails for AI. Um, that was a really interesting discussion. Um, we'd initially said that we supported guardrails for AI. I ended up voting against it based off of the discussion that we had during that. And effectively the discussion was, it's such a new technology that we don't wanna implement the wrong guardrails and inhibit things in the wrong way. So we need to kind of see how this is going to develop over the next short while we all agreed that guardrails were a good thing on AI, but we just didn't want to overreact to what was going on uh, and provide the wrong guardrails. So that was actually the entire resolution got lost as well. And then I think probably the last one I'll talk about is resolution 36. This one was one that we were not initially going to support. When we got there, they changed the, they proposed an amendment that erased all of the verbiage in there and basically provided a new verbiage to the amendment or a new verbiage to the resolution. And that one was to create a task force to analyze data and make policy recommendations back to the legislature on student safety risk assessment tools. So let's look at data about risk, you know, risky behaviors and what that looks like in a school environment. And then instead of saying we just want to create the tool, let's look at the data and use the data, the data, use the data to implement it or to, to make those policies. I this was one that was an interesting one. I proposed an amendment to the to their new verbiage that said that we wanted those 
results proposed back to us as a body so that we could review that because we the CASB delegate we as school board members are much closer to education than the legislature is and so having them look at data and make policy without consulting us was a concern so i proposed an amendment that said that we would have the recommendations prevent presented to casby that amendment passed during the debate uh people said well then who funds it and it got into this weird thing about who funds it then if they're providing the results back to us why are we the ones funding it why would the legislature fund it if they're not the ones getting the report back sorry i'm not looking at you i got more people over there um and so it it was an interesting debate uh discussion on that and so there was another amendment proposed to remove the exact words that i put in there to take it back to the original and so that also passed. So we had an, a majority vote to say, yeah, that makes sense. Let's have the results come back through us so we can provide some recommendations on policy to the legislature instead of them just doing it on their own. And then they also had a majority that said, no, we don't want to deal with that. So just send it back to the legislature. What I'll say is uh, the following week, I believe it was, I got an email from one of the CASB board members who sent that uh, emailed me and the representative from St. Brain who had proposed this said they understood where I was coming from with my amendment. This happened quickly. It was the end of the day, second to last one. It's we were pushing time to get out of the room. We were it's like, we have three minutes left and two more, so we need to hurry this up. Uh, and so it was, I'll admit it, it was a rushed amendment trying to get that in. I knew I should have probably worded it a little differently, but I was trying to just get the, the sentiment out there and, and have the dialogue um, with it failing. I wish I would have done a little differently, but I got the email that said, hey, we understand where you're coming from that, you know, so from the policy efforts or the lobbying efforts they're going to have with the legislature, they're going to incorporate that philosophy in as far as uh, being a consultant or CASB being consulted on the results and any potential policy that's coming out of it. So despite the amendment not going through in the verbiage of the resolution, it was understood by the CASB board and the lobbying committee that that is a valid rationale and was going to be presented in the lobbying efforts moving forward. So that's good. Basically, you just were um, kind of caught in between who was going to be paying for it. They didn't have a problem with us being consulted as a group. Correct. So I think that makes sense. I think if I would have said, um, instead of being presented to CASB, being, uh, you know, consulting CASB on policy updates, sure. I think we would have kept the verbiage in there. I think it was small language tweaks. Yeah. The sentiment was not lost. It was really around the funding of who pays for the That's good. efforts. Um, I will say it was a great weekend. Um, CASB said they're going to create an award for me. So I'm going to hold Mr. Matt Cook to that. Uh, he said they have never had someone present this many amendments at a assembly. And we ran out of amendment forms. I don't know if that's a good thing. Anytime you get an award, it's a good thing. And so uh, we ran out of amendment forms and they started, they're like, just use the hotel like paper pads to just write stuff on and send it over to us. Um, but all kidding aside, I actually was asked uh, two or three times to join the LRC next year because that way we can tweak some of these resolutions moving forward instead of having to submit so many amendments. So it's not a good thing because they don't want me to do it next year. Uh, so I've told them that I would, so I told them that uh, I was interested in being part of that committee, and so I'll, hopefully I'll be part of the legislative review committee next year, and can you know I'll have updates from CASB during the session, and then we'll be able to review some of these resolutions ahead of time. So all in all, it was a great opportunity. So thank you, Mr. Lavalley. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Self. That's great. I squeaky wheel gets to oil, as they say, and I think that's great that we or see stuff that, that needs to be tweaked, and we we say, hey, let's tweak it. All right. Ms. Cortez, how many people have signed up to speak during public comment section one? This evening, we have one individual signed up for section one. The board welcomes the comments of our community members. Speakers must sign up before 1 p.m. via an online form, and they must limit their remarks to two minutes or less. In deference to ASD 20 students, students will be allowed to speak first during the pu first public comment section. Following any students, speakers who wish to comment on an agenda item will be called in order of their sign up. We also ask speakers to address the board and not others in the room. All speakers will be notified of the remaining time via the mounted monitors. We 
behind the dais. When the time has ended, the microphone will turn off. Supplemental written materials can be given to the security guards and they will be delivered to the board secretary. Profanity or any disrespectful behavior will not be tolerated. We greatly value all comments from the public. However, the board will not respond this evening. Our first speaker is Catherine Chukas. Um, I, again, my name is Catherine Chukas. I will say that this format is a little uh, difficult to come up with public comments, but you'll see why in a second. Again, I live in the district. I'm an Air Academy parent. I'm a parent sounding board member. I'm the SAC chair up there. And I can't wait for you to hear from Mr. Olson about all the exciting things we've just dis we discussed at our SAC this morning. You're going to hear about that soon enough. Um, I, my animal update is really about the gazelles. The, the girls cross country team is amazing. And we've changed our schedule tomorrow at 2.15 to have an assembly to celebrate that team. Um, you all should come up to it. And I remember watching these girls run eight or nine years ago at Land Sharks Clubs when the Westside Elementaries run around Woodman Valley Park um, or Foothills Park. They've been uh, successful runners for a long time. And I think that speaks to, um, again, the neighborhood schools that you know we are allowed to watch these uh, talented athletes for many years. The same is true of the boys soccer team up there at Air Academy. They rolled up at 4 a.m. this morning after an amazing game in Durango last night. And if you're a soccer fan of boys soccer, uh, Liberty is still in the 5A tournament and Air Academy is still in the 4A tournament and they're both playing on Saturday. On agenda 9D, it would have been useful for the attachments to be available to everyone. It required a bit of Google and deciphering to find the uh, approved 2023 resolution booklet. I don't see the amendments and the changes. Um, and as you're part of the review committee next year in 2024, please remember to be to make sure that your perspective is about the leadership of a 26,000 student district of distinction, how we show our district's leadership and not just the opinions of five, of five board members. I was very disappointed when you guys talked about this a few weeks back and I shared that. It seems to me that resolution 30 was passed, not resolution 29, but again, I may have a bad document. Resolution 35, again, I think there are ways to um, use guardrails and adapt. The largest organizations, the largest enterprises in the world are doing that right now. And resolution 36 or 37, I would have been, it would have been useful to hear if that was going to ha happen anyway. Ms. Cortez, am I correct in assuming that no one has signed up to speak for public comment section two? Okay, debrief. Superintendent Haber, do you have any clarifications or next steps? No, I do not. All right. Debrief, Mr. Will Temby, happy birthday on November 8th. Do we sing? Oh. Uh, Mr. Temby doesn't want to, I get it, I get it. All right, we won't sing, but we, we certainly want to wish you a happy birthday. So, congratulations. No, not congratulations, everybody gets, yeah, just happy birthday. We'll keep it to happy birthday. All right, question eight from the CASB self-assessment. Are there items that the board would like to receive more information about at a future meeting? Was our business this evening focused on activities that promote and honor our mission statement, our belief statements, and our global end statement that reminds us that all students will have the knowledge, skills, and character necessary for successful transition to the next level and upon graduation will be fully prepared for success? Yes, we, had, uh, we got as high as eight people watching and we now have eight. Um, we are not ending the meeting right now, but we will be going into executive session. We need a motion. Uh, we need a motion for the Board of Education to convene an executive session pursuant to Colorado Revised Statute 24-6-4024FI to discuss personnel matters relating related to employees numbers 11756 and 2031. The board will confer with an attorney for the board for the purpose of receiving legal advice on specific legal questions related to such matters pursuant to CRS 24-6-4024B. While in executive session, the board will not adopt any proposed policy, resolution, regulation, or take any formal action. Lastly, the Colorado Open Meetings Law does not require the board to make record of the executive session in which the attorney is present and providing legal advice, which is according to CRS 24-6-4022D.5IIB. So moved. Second. Roll call, please. Mrs. Cloninger. Aye. Mrs. Cons. Aye. Mr. Lavalley. Aye. Mr. Salt. Aye. Mr. Temby. Aye. OK, 
Okay, this executive session will be held in the boardroom here and invited to this executive session are Mrs. Cloninger, Mrs. Cons, Mr. Lavalley, Mr. Salt, Mr. Temby also invited or Dr. Field, Mrs. Haber, Superintendent Haber, uh, Dr. Luhan Lindsay, uh, Mr. Cameron Smart, and Ms. Tanya Thompson. So the regular portion of the meeting is over. We just kind of ask everybody, if you don't mind to kind of leave in a fairly expeditious, we're gonna have the executive session in here.